Travel and Things presents In Conversation with, I'm your host, David Batsoffin, and my guest today, all the way from literally just across the road, is Jeff Lockwood, who is the resident manager at the Delta Environmental Center. Jeff, how are you doing? It has been a long time since we spoke. It has indeed, and uh, COVID, you know, COVID apart, is, things are going pretty well. Um, had a, a, a pretty good lockdown, actually. If you're going to be locked down, Delta Park's probably not the worst place in the world. And we had a lot of, of uh, maintenance work that I could get to on the center building during lockdown. So I got fresh air, sunshine, and a safe working environment. So did, pretty, pretty good all around. But did you get a Chevrolet? <laughs> no Chevrolet, <laughs> but I did have the joy of watching my owls actually go through most of their breeding cycle right above my head as I was working. So that was pretty special. We go, we're going to talk about your owls in a moment or two, but first I want to find out about the Delta and more specifically the building that you find yourself in. I mean, it's an Art Deco building in the middle of a park. Whose idea was that? A, and there's a, this is a two-part question. And the second part is, why is it Delta Park? Is it a Delta of two rivers or is it just a Delta? Okay, so the, the, the building. Uh, we have the um, possibly dubious pleasure of living in a, uh, an Art Deco building, which dates back to the early 1930s. And uh, it was one of four wastewater treatment plants that were built on the uh, outskirts of the then Johannesburg. And this was the Delta plant. So if you look at the facade of our building, it actually, in nice Greek Greek letters, actually names the place Delta. So we were the Delta Wastewater Treatment Works. And uh, as is the case with most of these things, eventually the sheer development of, of Johannesburg meant that the capacity of Delta was outstripped and they had to move all of the treatment um, facilities further and further afield. And so this building actually was vacant and, and deteriorating. And at the time, our founder was invited to come and uh, help set up a bird sanctuary in what was then being developed as Delta Park. And during the three years he was busy with that process, he kept looking at this building and thinking, you know, I can do something with that. And he made the city an offer they literally could not refuse. They had <laughs> put out a, a um, demolition tender, which was uh, going to be of the order of 40,000 Rand to demolish the building. And instead, he took it over and renovated it and, and installed the Delta Environmental Center and the museum into the what was by then already a pretty... Um, you know, pretty badly derelict building mm. and uh, turned it around into a, a, a massive asset for the city. So that's that's where we that's where we fit in, you know, and that goes you, back over 40 years now. But people who think, oh, Jeff Lockwood live, seems to live in Delta Park. There, there's no apartment in there that you can sort of overnight in a sort of a bed and a TV and those sort of things. Or is there? It, there's actually a flat on the top of the the, the last, last floor of the tower part of the building. So I've been staying here since the 12th of December, 1981. Mm -hmm. And it is an awesome place. It, you know, uh, as I said, we've got the owls, we've got uh, an incredible bird life. We get the odd visit from genets. We, see, we still see things like slender mongoose and stuff like that. And with a bird list of, you know, going on for 230 species, there's always a reason to get up and get take your coffee out onto the roof first thing in the morning and see what's flying around. I, I can heartily agree with that. I mean, I think Delta is an underutilized destination as a birding destination because everybody wants to get out of the city. But it seems that if you say over 200 species right here in the heart of Johannesburg, um, all you got to do is just sit and be quiet and let them come to you, basically. 
Yeah, and and you know the crazy thing is that um, when you start looking, uh, it's incredible. You know what kind of stuff has pitched up in the park. We've had some national rarities like lesser cuckoo. We've had sooty falcon. Um, we've had some really bizarre things arrive or pass over. Um, just yesterday morning, after a very long break, I had a single spurwing goose cruising over the park. Um, just before seven. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those places that, that generally delivers. There's always some interesting birds around, but there's always the chance of something really exceptional. And I, I suppose that's one of those, those things I'm in the ideal position to yeah. record because yeah, yeah living here and, and, and taking full advantage. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a brilliant place. And uh, the birding is relatively easy. Uh, one of the things that is starting at the moment is the breeding cycles of our sparrowhawks. And it's not uncommon to see all three sparrowhawk species, the black, the avamba, and the little sparrowhawk in an hour's watch off the tower in the morning. So, uh, you know, that's worth, worth just taking a stroll around yeah. for in the, you know, right yeah. off there. As I said in my in my opening, uh, we live not too far from each other, and I've had that little sparrow hawk in my garden. And interestingly yeah. enough, I sent a picture off to I think it was when BirdLife Africa was still publishing the magazine. Um, I sent a photograph off, and it was published, let's say on page ten. And I turned over to page eleven, and lo and behold, there was a picture of the same bird. But now it was from Emerentia, not from Linden. So I managed to track down the photographer. And I said, I think we photographed the same bird. And it turns out we had. It had just moved from suburb to suburb. Yeah. And I don't think bird life actually realized that it was the same bird. But that, that aside, it was a very exciting sighting because it sat quietly in the garden. It allowed me to get within probably five or six meters of it. Um, and it just stared at me as if to say, well, what yeah. do you want to do? Yeah, well, I've just had an interesting run in the last five, six weeks. I've had seven different black sparrowhawks come through Delta Park. Uh, we've got a pair which actually have a nest in the park, um, but we've been visited by uh, juvenile females. We've been visited by two juvenile males and a full adult male. So it's incredible for a bird that certainly... 30 years ago was not even on our radar here mm -hmm. in suburban Johannesburg to actually have that population float, you know, floating around and yeah. visiting our open spaces. Now you mentioned, earlier, oh, let me just stick with birds for a moment before I go off on a tangent. There is a bird hide within Delta Park. I seem, seem to think I walk past it on a rel rel uh, relatively regular basis. Is that open to the public? Is it safe? Because I think this is the thing that everybody wants to know about Delta Park. How safe is it if you walk in there with camera equipment? Okay. Um, that's actually quite a tricky question because that seems to fluctuate from one day to the next almost. I think as a general comment, sensible precautions always. Uh, just because we haven't had an incident for three or four weeks or months or whatever, doesn't mean to say that you're bulletproof. And yeah. um, there have been a couple of incidents. We've got an initiative. I'm involved with Josie Trails. Mm, I saw, uh, which I've is seen the guys out, the Trails Guardians. Yeah. yeah. And we've got an initiative to try and improve things and, and make it safe for all users. But, yeah, it's it still means... Be careful. Yeah. Um, I do take the cam my camera out personally every now and then, but certainly if I'm going into remote areas and particularly if I'm very early or very late in the park, I tend not to take the yeah. camera with me just as a precaution. But yeah, it's it's um, so far, touch wood, we, we seem to be fairly okay. Uh, and, you know, if you come in a group or you basically sort of stick to the more open areas where you're visible. Um, it seems like it's okay. not, not too bad. Yeah. And the hide is my question. Okay, is, so is the it accessible? Hide, 
Well, it's actually effectively just off the general park. So, you know, it's got a, a, a slightly raised viewing position overlooking one of two dams. There are, in fact, two hides in the park. And uh, so it's fully, ex fully accessible from the outside. Okay. Uh, but not necessarily from a photographic point of view, the most useful or the most effective vantage. Oh, okay. Pity that, because it would be nice to have sort mm. of a wetland that you could have an underground hide and you could sit there for hours and just wait to see what happens. I have an enormous respect for bird photographers. You have, they have the patience, and I'm going to include you in these. They have the patience of Job. I can't sit and wait for hours and hours and hours for a bird to do something. I'd rather park off with lions and hopefully, well, they do nothing as well. I mean, but they at least do it out in the open. I don't have to look for them. Yeah, well, no, I was going to say, if you, if you actually think trying to photograph lions doing something during daylight <laughs> is easier than birds, then you obviously have been meeting different lions. Um, no, look, you know, the thing with the thing with my kind of photography is uh, because I generally walk in the park and I, I have been doing active monitoring of the bird life in the park now for just over 20 years and sort of ad hoc monitoring for nearly 30 years prior to that. But I've also, since the start of the, the National Bird or the Regional Bird Atlas Project, been doing regular five daily cards based mostly in Delta Park. And so, you know, walking, you, you cover the whole park looking for as many different bird species as you can locate. And having the camera along means you that if anything does present itself, you can try and grab it. Mm. You know, there's nothing worse than seeing something incredible or observing <laughs> absolutely amazing behavior and your camera is nicely packed away up in the flat upstairs. <coughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of <clears throat> I've, I've I've done it uh, once, and I have promised myself never to ever make that mistake again. And I must admit, I've largely kept to that promise. Yeah, I hear, I hear what you're saying. When I, when I walk in the mornings, although it's at like seven o'clock, I tend not to take a camera or a cell phone with me. And then I see the most awesome images, as I think, if only. You know, th th yeah. that, that ubiquitous, if only, and I go, well, I don't have. Let me just enjoy the moment so I won't capture it for posterity. That's all. Yeah. Other people want to come. Just, just on that note, Jeff, do you do guided walks around um, Delta Park? I, I don't kind of set them up myself in the sense that it generally, you know, it tends to be requests from either one of the local bird clubs or something like that, <clears throat> just uh, for two reasons. One, my life tends to be a little bit complicated and things come out of the woodwork, you know, with kind of uh, awesome regularity, in fact, and, mm -hmm. and, and usually at the worst possible timing. <laughs> um, so, you know, the more, the more you kind of plan ahead, the more problems you tend to paint yourself, uh, you know, into a corner over. So, yeah, but if somebody like, you know, the local Witzburg Club or Rand Barberts or one of those wants to do a walk mm. um, or a couple of the other user groups, then, you know, and I'm around, I'm definitely up for it because uh, I would probably be walking anyway. Yeah, so you and, may as well walk and, and talk. We'll walk and talk and give people, you know, some ideas of what the place is about and, and all the rest of it. So you're a man that can walk and chew gum at the same time, basically. Uh, yeah, I think that's partly, you know, the kind of stuff you have to do. Um, uh, one of the things I do, apart from my day job, as it were, is I actually lead birding tours in Southern Africa for an American-based natural history tour operator called Victor Emmanuel Nature Tours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with its beautiful, nice, you know, sort of small group size, maximum of, of six. And, uh, but you're looking after them, you're entertaining them, you're actually informing them. Um, you're trying to give them full value for their trip out here. And uh, so you have to be able to multitask a bit to actually get all that right. You do indeed. Now, I'm not a Canon user, 
But I have to say, mm -hmm. I had a bit of can a camera envy yesterday when I had a look at the new Canon mirrorless together with a mm. 400 2.8 when I'm big one day. I mean, I shoot with the index <laughs> equipment I always have, and my biggest is a 560, but it's nowhere yeah. near a 2.8. And that is, I think everybody's dream lens is that 400 2.8. Look, there, there's some awesome stuff. A friend of mine has just upgraded to the mirrorless, and she went with the the hundred five hundred zoom lens, right? Which is just a step up on the on the one I use. I use the the sort of hundred uh, hundred to four hundred, and uh, there's a lot to be envious about, particularly <laughs> with that camera. <laughs> and that that sort of eye following technology that it has is really impressive but what is a problem for me still is that that's that sort of millisecond lag with the electronic viewfinder mm. um if you've ever used any of those bridge cameras yeah you'll know how kind of how there's always that sort of you know things are happening and you can't see and nothing's going and nothing and because you can't see it won't let you you know take a picture and 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 there's they've come a long way from that level yeah but it's still not quite the same as using the you know the traditional prism uh yeah, mirror right, yeah. operation so how many thousands of tail feathers exiting top left or bottom right do you have in your collection or have you deleted all of those? Um, I try and delete um, the best is you try and delete them in the field before you even <laughs> you know download. But every now and then, you know, we go away and we do and and we go and you know spend a couple of days in Kruger or something, and you come back with three thousand pictures. Yeah. Um and and it's it's getting worse now because now the bugs of bugs has bitten and uh so i'm doing dragonflies and damselflies and butterflies and spiders <laughs> and reptiles and you name it and um so you know you've got these these incredible pictures of and sorry i'm also doing orchids and some wildflowers and stuff like that on the is there side. anything you don't photograph so, like weddings I know I, I don't do people very often at all. I'm kind of it's a different mindset, but yeah, it's it's a great it's a great um, great way to explore. You're looking closely. You're looking at everything, and um, the only problem is coming and then filing it and sorting yeah. it so you can find it again. This is my problem. I file so badly, and then I was away this past week and. Uh, I had an issue with my laptop, and when I got back home, I realized that I had over 72,000 images on my laptop, uh, which I'd forgotten yeah. to download and get rid of, sort of clear the laptop. It was, yeah. You know, who has 72,000 pictures on their laptop? It's, it it's mm. just defies description. I'm, I'm assuming, and we're sort of going a little bit off track from Delta now, but I'm assuming that you started with film photography. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I had a lot of slides, and again, almost exclusively in those days, birds. Mm. Um, and, you know, obviously the flexibility of a digital platform has made yeah. such a difference. Yeah. Um, the quality, the ability to crop in, um, you know, the flexibility of being able to literally blaze away uh, for, you know, kind of, two hours watching a pair of black sparrowhawks at a nest and not wincing every time you press the trigger, you know, the shutter that, you know, there goes another five bucks in terms of slide, <laughs> slide film and whatever. And you just hope like hell your settings are right because you'll only yeah. really find that out once, once you get the stuff back. So, you know, digital has really changed the game and, um, I'm so much happier with everything because yeah. you can see what you're doing wrong if you are doing something radically wrong. And you can fix it but immediately. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's this, whether you take one or 1,000 pictures of the same thing, mm. um, the cost is actually the same. There's a time <laughs> factor, obviously. <laughs> 
it's yeah. it's sitting and editing raw files afterwards that where all of a sudden you understand what the word me workflow means. <laughs> yes. yes. Jeff, are there Indeed. any parts of the of Delta Park that are better than others when it comes to to looking for bird species? Um it's a good question. It tends to stuff tends to move around in response thing, to things like fruiting of certain trees and stuff like that. Um, so normally, what I would do is I would try and walk pretty well a full circuit. So I, I go from Delta from the Environmental Centre building down to the bird sanctuary, go down towards the bottom along the sprat either come back between the Girl Guides and the Bird Sanctuary or go all the way up to the other entrance, the old main gatehouse entrance, and then through that garden area there, which is often very good in summer for paradise flycatchers, they like nesting there. Okay. And then sort of up to the top dams and then across below Delta School, um, and then down through that long grass, uh, grassland in that north, northern corner of the park, and then back to the center. And the reason I do that, that loop is because different species like to hang out in different parts of that, that circuit. Uh, top dam is, is usually pretty good for things like malachite kingfishers, uh, always worth looking. This past summer, the uh, woodland kingfishers were hanging around mostly up there. The sparrowhawks hunt over there. And uh, you also get things like Rhinek and, and cardinal woodpeckers more usually up in that corner of the park. And then for things like your cysticulas, your levance and zitting cysticulas, that's mainly that long grassy area in the northern corner below Delta School. Mm. And the bird sanctuary, um, if you're on the Delta environmental center side of the bird sanctuary, there's an observation mound looking out over that dam. And the, from there is often a good place to actually look out for the black sparrowhawks because they breed in that thicket below the main dam wall. Ah, okay. And so they're quite often in the tops of those trees. So it's, it's always worth spending a bit of time there as well. There have been no birding books done on the Delta specifically, or, bird, or is there a birding list available for people who, who like to tick boxes? If they like ticking boxes, I've got a, a checklist of the birds I've recorded in the park, uh, or when I say I've recorded, almost all of them have been you know, cited by myself, but I've included a couple of confirmed sightings from other people. And that stands, I think, at about 230 species. And that is downloadable off the Delta Environmental Center website. Okay, because that was going so to be my they, next question is how do they, they get it? Well, you just answered yeah. that. So if they just go to Delta Environmental Center on the website and just scroll through for the bird list. And then if people sort of have taken images and go, as I don't know what this is, and if they're anything like me, they've gone through their Sassel bird book and still don't know, and then they go through uh, Doug Newman's LBJs and that doesn't give them answers or Ken Newman's book, and that doesn't give them answers. Can they send pictures in and will you help them ID? Yeah, look, if people send stuff through to the Delta website, anything like that uh, gets forwarded through to me and I'll do my best. Obviously, it depends on the quality of the image. <laughs> yeah. and, um, the speck in the sky you know, and the distance I, I, with a cell phone. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been sent some stuff, which quite honestly could have been anything from a uh, speck of dirt on the lens to, you know, to kind of a ridge to a vulture. It was, it was <laughs> literally, I think, one pixel or two pixels big. Um, and, you know, it just, you try and zoom in and, and, and you know what, that, what it looks like. It's, yeah. it's kind of, so, you know, the trick also is, you know, don't, don't send, you know, kind of raw files. Don't send, you know, sort of 20 meg, 20 meg uh, <laughs> processed images. Uh, but also don't, you know, sort of downsize them to the point where if I want to try and see what the eye color is, uh, you, can't. you can't zoom in at all. Yeah. Um, and then one to you know, two megs, max. One to two yeah, megs, that yeah. should do it. I, I remember in my early days of writing, 
Um, I was writing for the Star at the time, and I sent off 13 images to cover some stories, but they were all 20 meg pictures. I didn't think that one through. And by the time I pushed the last one, the first one was coming back. Um, yes. With read our rules and our terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> the editors were not happy with me. Yeah. You learn very no, well. look, that'll crash most, that'll even these days will crash servers. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Jeff, is there any, are weekdays better than weekends? Because I know we were in the park on, on Sunday and there were lots of people. And I think a lot of it was because of the cosmos. There were people and photographers all over the place in amongst that yeah. cosmos. And then during the week when I walk in there, it's relatively quiet. There are people with their dogs, um, their runners and cyclists and all that type of thing. But is there a good time for birders? I think birders generally fairly early in the mornings tends to work better. Fortunately, most of the birds in Delta are used to the people. You know, so it's not like the people arrive and the birds disappear. Yeah. Um, what has been interesting, in fact, is that usage of the park has grown exponentially since COVID. And I think partly that was because Delta was the only public open space mm. which couldn't be locked. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as as soon as the as soon as the um, kind of lockdown rules eased a bit and you could exercise. Uh, you know, strictly speaking, only in your street kind yes. of thing and between, what was it, six and nine or something. Um, it was amazing how many people considered Delta Park to be an extension of their street. <laughs> and that, that trend has just continued. You know, people discovered Delta during that, that kind of uh, lockdown period and, mm. and they've stayed true to it. And, and we've seen a fantastic growth in people. Which is wonderful. Sorry. No, it's okay. I had to learn the hard way as well. Turn my, put my phone on silent before we chat. Um, Jeff, we're almost out of time. Thank you. So, but what I haven't asked you, and, and before we, we say goodbye, the owls. Everybody follows you on Facebook with your owl stories. They come, they go, they live, they die, they mate, they don't mate. Um, you like the, what was that woman that used to write, was it for personality? One of those agony aunts. Um, and I use the term in a generic form that, that mm -hmm. is keeping everybody up to date, the sort of the, the gossip granny of the, of the area, keeping people up to date with who's doing what in the house next door. Yeah, look, I think it started from simply from a position that I was, I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to work with these birds at close hand for, for over 30 years. And this past year, because of COVID and because of the fact I was working out on the roof, I literally was watching the progress of the breeding, the breeding season minute by minute, which even for me was a unique and, and incredible experience. And I just felt it'd be really nice to actually share that with people. Mm. And I started the process and then of course, things went pear-shaped. We had a disaster. We had a chick die, we had the male die a day later, uh, one of the other remaining chicks disappeared. And so, you know, there was, it, it was, I suppose, a teaching moment as well, because unfortunately, life is tough out there. You know, we yeah. have this warm, fuzzy feeling that as long as, you know, nature is wonderful and nothing can go wrong and, and it's not like that. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, it opened the door and I started it. And, and when the, the last chick actually left the park, I thought, well, okay, well, we'll call it quits. And of course, then the whole process of, of a new male coming in and starting to, you know, um, court the female and, and gradually, you know, sort of move into a position where hopefully they'll breed in a few months time. So, you know, I kind of just said goodbye and I was back again talking about the dating game. So <laughs> here we go. Did, did I don't think I'm, I'm going to get off. <laughs> no, you're Sorry, not going to get off. Yeah. You're going to have to take, ride this pony until it's, it's end. Did you ever find out what caused the death of those birds or did you just write it off to some sort of natural event? 
Um, look, it wasn't natural in the sense that both, you know, the, the chick particularly looked fine. Mm. And an hour later, just actually sort of walked over to a puddle of, of rainwater on the roof. Uh, and then just suddenly was convulsing and, and, and was dead in, you know, kind of seconds kind of thing. Wow. And uh, that, that we couldn't pin it down to anything. It wasn't some of the more normal or regular causes of death like trichomonas, which is a parasite they get. It didn't appear to be a rodenticide secondary poisoning incident. So we're, we're still flummoxed. The male was very light. Uh, he'd lost a lot of weight. Uh, I had ringed him a couple of years earlier and he was nearly 200 grams lighter than he had been when I ringed him. Mm. And uh, so we, we're still not sure. They did try and perform autopsies on both birds, but um, couldn't get anything definitive from that. Okay, well, let's hope the new, this new youngster that's moved in likes older women or that the old lady likes younger men and that you, you get uh, chicks and it's a successful breeding. Well, he, he, he's, he's, he's sitting next to her at the moment okay. and things seem to be heading in the right direction, but I'm not convinced he knows what he's in for <laughs> because the male has a hell of a lot of work to do when they start breeding. Really? Well, she just goes in on the, on the eggs and mm. he has to catch food for himself and for her. And when the eggs start hatching and for the chicks as well. So he's got to sharpen up his act very quickly. Has, has he not got Uber Eats on speed dial? Well, I don't know. I might have to be the Uber Eats on speed dial <laughs> if he can't cut the mustard. <laughs> Jeff, it's been absolutely wonderful chatting to you. Thank you so much for sharing some wonderful information uh, with both myself and my viewers. And, and thanks and keep up the good work. Great, it's been a pleasure.